In this latest episode of the New Stack Makers podcast, we take a look at what to expect from uh, KubeCon EU 2022, which is coming up quickly, May 16th through 20th of May in Valencia, Spain. Uh, we want to give the listeners an idea of what to expect from this year's conference and you know, maybe also discuss the uh, state of Kubernetes for those who can't attend. Uh, our guests today are Priyanka Sharma, the General Manager of uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Welcome, Priyanka. Hello. Thanks for having me, Joe. Excellent. Great to have you again. And also on board, we have Ricardo Rocha, who is a computer engineer at CERN and uh, also one of the uh, participants who helped put together this year's uh, 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 conference. Welcome, Ricardo. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Terrific, terrific. So let's jump right in. First of all, uh, we were all surprised last year when uh, uh, the Europe location was Valencia. Uh, so why don't we just jump to the important thing. Uh, what are some of the fun things that attendees might want to do when they're in Valencia uh, for this conference? Oh my gosh, it is such an exciting place to go. I am thrilled to go there. I think all the attendees will benefit from this beautiful city we are going to. Valencia is actually known for its paella, the rice dish. Uh, they have beautiful beaches and the old town is just so charming. Uh, also, they have spectacular weather, 300 days of sunshine. So for a lot of us, that's going to be amazing. Um, and oh, by the way, they have a market called Central Market, which is home to Europe's largest fresh produce market. So these are just cool things about the city to tell you that so much to do, so much to explore. I, for one, am thrilled to be going. Nice, nice. Uh, Ricardo, have you been to Valencia before? I have been to Valencia. I actually have uh, a few colleagues also that are from, from the region. So I'm looking forward also to to ask them for some tips, but I guess after Priyanka's summary, uh, I'll ask Priyanka, Priyanka instead for, for some tips. <laughs> terrific, terrific. Uh, so, uh, speaking of sunny places, um, uh, the last conference uh, in Los Angeles, uh, we had a good time there as well, uh, was very sunny as well. Uh, but but what, what changes have uh, you both seen in the Kubernetes ecosystem since uh, last October? I think, uh, you know, a great piece of research that we put out in, in the time frame that you mentioned is uh, the CNCF annual uh, survey report. And what that has told us is that today Kubernetes is mainstream and going under the hood. So 96% of organizations that were interviewed for the survey said that they were either using Kubernetes in production already or they were going to. And at the same time, 79% of people who responded also said that they were using a managed service, Kubernetes as a managed service. Okay. So that tells me that Kubernetes is seriously matured and going under the hood, all of which is great news because being the bedrock of the cloud native movement, if it's de facto, we're in business. Yes. Very definitely. And, and, this, and you've seen this even more than the same time last year, I take it. Definitely, definitely. I think this has been a big jump uh, in the last year for sure. And I think part of that is what's been happening in the global arena, for lack of a better word, where I think the pandemic really accelerated uh, cloud nativization of mo or modernization of technologies because everybody became a digital company. So I think this has been, today, now we're in rock solid in the de facto standards stage. Terrific, terrific. Uh, so uh, I know there's been a big uh, uh, a push uh, on the behalf of CNCF to uh, attract a global user base, not just uh, America, Americas, and and Europe. Uh, you know, what 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 efforts have you been doing lately? I know I've been I've been keeping an eye on the uh, cloud native glossary and the internationalization efforts there. Absolutely, I think um, you know looking at the whole world as the constituent for cloud native has been uh, in our DNA from day zero, you know, and every, uh, from the beginning, uh, the leadership focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which includes geographical diversity, right? And like, you know, actually referring back to the survey, for the first one we ever did, we had like in 2016, we had like 99% participants. 
This time round, we had 38 times that many with like 3,829 participants. And if you look at the regions they came from, they came um, like 29% from Europe. Uh, some 27 from percent from Asia, North America, 25%. Africa was represented 8%. Australia and Oceania was represented at 6%. <laughs> South wow. and Central America was represented at 3%. So, you know, the diversity was just there in the numbers and it was super cool to see. Um, and I think it's the result of a lot of effort. We try to do things that are time, like, you know, in multiple time zones or, uh, you know, alternating time zones or, you know, just, picking times that are suitable for as many locations as possible. We The Cloud Native Glossary is actually a great initiative to talk about in that way, where I think they at this point, they have at least 10 language teams that are active Gosh. right now to um, nine teams that are active right now to bring the gl gl glossary in um, in different languages. So I'll tell you a few that I know. I know like the Korean translation, there's a Hindi translation, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, there's like so many. And, you know, this this is such a cool effort because even if everybody is proficient in English, sometimes really complicated concepts, if you can read them in your native language, it's going to just like, you know, you're going to absorb it that much better. Right. So that's, that's an ongoing effort. Um, and I think this is like, you know, and even in, when you look at the CNCF, like diversity mentorships that we do every year, we get people from all over the world. And that's by design. We want that to happen. And I think the results of all those efforts start showing up in things like um, the annual survey respondents. Nice, nice. Uh, so uh, I was very surprised to know that uh, the United States isn't even the, uh, uh, the where uh, it doesn't even have the highest percentage of users, which is good good news. So it's I not know. just <laughs> a, a local thing for us. Uh, so what are what are the virtual options for those of us who can't attend? Uh, we also be doing the virtual uh, 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 virtual presentations as well. Yes, absolutely. For uh, those who have attended previous events, they will be familiar with our Meeting Play platform, which we've been using for the last two at least. And we're going to use it again. It's for the virtual attendees. And just like the past, there will be like multiple interactive areas allowing like virtual attendees, like you can participate in the keynote or the breakout sessions. You can also attend virtual project office hours, which I highly recommend because it's an opportunity to meet the maintainers, right? Uh, and you can learn about the project, ask questions, new features, things like that. And then, of course, there's the solutions showcase, which is where you engage with our sponsors. And I highly recommend this, not only because they're sponsoring and supporting this event, helping it to happen, but because what you get there are demos, live presentations, and office hours, so alongside like job opportunities and track. So they make these engage like interactions really mm -hmm. meaningful and useful so all of that is available online nice nice i didn't know that that that, that uh that option was available virtually as yes. well so i have to check that out awesome. all right terrific uh, how many people are you expecting in person this year well we're hoping for five thousand people in person um and more than that virtually of course all right all right Terrific, terrific. Uh, Ricardo, uh, is this, you've been to CubeCons before, I take it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I've been going for a few, yeah. I'm very, I'm very curious as to how, I, we, we've all been following CERN uh, and the Particle Accelerator for, for years now. How does, how does CERN use Kubernetes? We, we actually, we started using Kubernetes and projects in the Kubernetes ecosystem quite early. Uh, back in 2016, we had our first production deployments. Um, the, the usage has grown quite significantly. And uh, today, we have uh, over 300 clusters uh, with thousands of nodes and uh, tens of thousands of, of cores. And, and we, we use it for, for pretty much everything. The, the core use case for us is, is of course, data analysis, uh, the data coming out of the, acceler the detectors and the uh, processing and analyzing that. Uh, so we use it for, for a large chunk of that. And then we also started using it for the internal processes uh, uh, at CERN for like our administrative clusters, all, all that is uh, kind of the business use case. We are, we are also using it there. Uh, but but it's kind of a natural uh, transition for us. We, we, are, we are always looking for new technologies that can make us more efficient and make the best of our resources. 
So we've been building on that and the knowledge has uh, spread and yeah, the use cases keep coming. Nice, nice. And, and you guys, Eddie's in house, I take it. Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. 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 We have, we have for, for most, we use on premises resources. We started using uh, also managed uh, solutions from public cloud providers for use cases where we don't have a lot of resources on, in house, things like uh, uh, GPUs, accelerators, uh, and we started integrating those as well. This is where Kubernetes has played a major role as well, because this, this kind of setups, hybrid setups has been a challenge uh, for us. Uh, for many years and uh, kind of having this standardized API, but not only API, uh, this declarative way of defining applications made things a lot more more uh, straightforward for us. So I wouldn't say you guys are necessarily using multi-cloud, but you are. You do have hybrid environments in which uh, declarative configuration really helps ease things between environments, I take yeah, it. Absolutely. Uh, this, this is, uh, we do use multiple clouds, uh, um, the majority is on premises, but it's not only it's Kubernetes, but it's also uh, all the projects around them, around it that uh, kind of uh, make all these tasks uh, a lot easier. So we've been exploring as much as possible this kind of uh, setup. All right, terrific. So let's uh, let's dive into the uh, the material at this year's show. What what would you uh, both say the themes are for this this year's show in particular? So our tagline this year is onward and upward, grow with cloud native. And the whole theme there is we've done so much in the past years, particularly I think we did a lot in 2021. And now we just keep going. And, you know, that's, uh, that's reflected in how a lot of organizations are approaching us when they come to CNCF for membership. They're like, okay, we are all in now. Now it's a matter of like <laughs> onward and upward. Let's keep, how do we keep going and execute on this, right? And that's kind of the theme of the show as well. And I think you will see that in like the various talks and sessions and, all, and the type of people who attend as well. Another thing that I will mention is this year's co-chairs were all three end users, Ricardo is from CERN, right? Uh, Emily is from Apple and Jasmine is from Twitter. And you will see, you will notice in the talk selection, it's particularly the keynote selection, just how end user heavy the content is and that, okay, and you all end users picked this. It's kind of showing, that's my personal take. Nice. Yeah, I would, I would stress this as well, like the... I think there will be a, a strong presence of end users as well in the conference. And I, I was talking more of the technical side, but actually one of the big benefits of uh, onboarding uh, our use cases into this kind of um, uh, technology is also the support we get from from the community, uh, the the large user base, and and um, the, the sharing of experiences. And we do it all the time, but these conferences are, are a, a, a huge opportunity to 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 extend this. I absolutely agree with Ricardo because, I mean, think about it, right? This is like hundreds of thousands of contributors, but not only are they individuals, they're all working at different companies in different time zones, different countries. So the need for that face-to-face -face interaction, collaboration is all that much more to move our community forward. And I think, I'm hoping that Valencia, Spain will be the big blockbuster event that we've all been kind of raring to get to. Nice, nice. So Kubernetes has matured and uh, now's the time to uh, look at those edge cases and scalability uh, challenges and uh, bringing it to the next level, as you said. Absolutely, 100%. All right. Uh, so uh, I always enjoy the keynotes, uh, not only for Kubernetes, but also for uh, many related technologies. What are some of the... Uh, uh, other cloud native technologies should we uh, keep an eye out for at the keynotes this this year? Oh, that's a great question. I think that so one thing you will definitely see in the keynotes is that they're very heavy end user, uh, and that's you know the, by design the committee was such the chairs were such that you see that. But besides Kubernetes, you see a lot of cool stuff. You're going to see uh, a story about uh, Cube Edge, for example. You're going to see, which is a project that re re uh, relies on Kubernetes, but is about edge deployments. Um, and so you're going to see a story about it. I don't want to give too much away because like notifications are still under progress. Um, nice. 
you also hear a lot about how to think about literally like uh, like pro- like when you do, when you have end user focused stories, right? It's a lot about workflows and process and how are they doing. So you hear things literally about how to how to do canary deployments, canary clusters, things like that. So it's a lot of like workflow based stories storytelling. Um, you also hear you will definitely hear about security and observability projects because people are starting to tell a holistic story, and I think this is going to be critical in this event and all subsequent events is the fact that when Kubernetes becomes foundational, then you want to talk more about all the other projects that are, you know, propping up the house. And uh, I think this time's keynotes are a beginning of that. And will th- this will hold continue as KubeCon after KubeCon. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Of course, my favorite part of the uh, con- or the uh, technical presentations. Uh, Ricardo, I was kind of curious from what you've seen, what are, few, what are some of the presentations or some of the tracks, in, in any case, that uh, we should keep a close eye on? Yeah, so I, I think that there are, there are tracks that have been um, um, kind of stable over the last few KubeCons and things like operations, customizing extended Kubernetes, security observability, they are really strong tracks with amazing content. Uh, there are some variations on the kind of submissions there, but I think they are really like uh, well-established. Uh, there, there are some that have, we've seen uh, maybe growing, which is in things like business value, um, when, when people start uh, knowing how to make the best of Kubernetes in their own environments and uh, kind of uh, starting to talk about that and and uh, share the, their experiences more. I think that will be quite interesting. And then there's one that is uh, kind of very close to, to me, which is we, we've added a research track. And this is... Um, this is a nice effort to, um, like uh, Priyanka was saying, that uh, Kubernetes is now well established and we start seeing additional use cases popping up. I think the research and scientific and uh, kind of high performance computing use cases is, is something that is showing up as well um, because people want to, like, the more traditional um, deployments in this area start seeing value also on Kubernetes and, and trying to integrate there. So there, there's nice initiatives that have happened in the last couple of months that are pushing this use case forward. And uh, we'll see this in, at KubeCon, I think, as well. So that's quite interesting. Well, that's that, that's a, that's a uh, major shift. I, I know we've covered the supercomputing space for years now, and uh, it, it seems like Kubernetes would be a natural fit, but uh, it sounds like this is the first, only recently has the HPC community started uh, looking into it. Uh, as a feasibility, I guess. There, there's a couple of challenges to, to be uh, solved. So this is uh, also an opportunity to, to get everyone together and uh, work work on it. Uh, but th- there will be already some nice uh, um, um, reports from, from people doing great work in this area. But it's, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to build on it. I know Ricardo doesn't want to give too much away, but there is, there is cool stuff around HPC for sure. Nice, nice. Um, So uh, one of the surprises uh, at the last KubeCon was uh, observability. Now, observability, we've always, you know, we've always known it was important, but uh, I think last year we really saw where it was actually, you know, a a major part of Kubernetes and cloud-native computing. Uh, I mean, is is my assumption here correct? I mean, observability is more than an add-on. I think you'll see at this conference, it's kind of core for the monitoring and and deployment of cloud-native workloads. I would 100% agree, you know, and I think the reason observability is of growing importance is because when we started with cloud-native, right, we were operationalizing containers, really. That was what we were doing. That in itself was hard enough, for sure. But over time, we have taken cloud-native principles have become about, okay, container workloads, um, as well as on-prem workloads, stateful, stateless. You add in edge over there. So you kind of get this multi-hybrid cloud edge type of world that all cobbles together to be cloud native. And when that's the scenario, when the same type of people, when the same type of mindset and culture is looking at all these very diverse deployments, you need to be able to see through all of this. Observability is how you do do that. And so I think that's why with growing heterogeneity 
observability will just keep being more and more important. Terrific, terrific. Uh, also at the last KubeCon, we saw a lot um, around cost management, uh, which is a surprise to me. But just generally speaking, uh, what sorts of, um, you know, we're talking a lot about use cases, of course, um, and sharing stories from the field, but what sorts of needs are you seeing uh, from the enterprise for Kubernetes that may have been different than before? Well, my perspective is that the end users are coming first and foremost for learning and development, right? I'm kind of really happy to see that more and more end users are sending lar larger teams. And so that's a really good sign because that means that they're getting good educational value from it. I think uh, because we have these end user coaches, they have chosen content that's super relevant, that is about day-to-day, -day like, you know, day one operations, day two operations, all of that. And it's very practically minded. Um, and I think that's what the enterprises want and expect. So that's kind of what we're saying. That's my perspective. Ricardo, please. Uh, and I, I think it's also an extension of what Priyanka was talking about before, which is this, um, the, like cloud native is reaching out to a lot more areas uh, and meaning we have multi-cluster, multi-cloud, uh, hybrid deployments. And this brings challenges uh, in terms of observability, but it also brings a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, being more efficient, exploring other types of resources. And you, you, you mentioned uh, like the importance of co cost management. I think this is also where it comes from. Like the, I, I, at least in my environment, um, we, we traditionally had on-premises deployments that had a certain way of uh, 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 I don't know, calculating cost and maintaining it long term. And now we see more kind of opportunistic resources where cost management has other challenges as well. So maybe maybe the interest also comes from there to make the best of out of these additional resources, additional opportunities that uh, that were put in. I definitely want to chime in there. And this is why actually I got confused about the question because I was like, wait, cost management or the teams? But I agree uh, this the you know, with multi-hybrid, cloud, edge, on-prem, everything going on, the complexity increases. And we're not at a stage in our, in our journey right now that everything's commoditized, which is when I think the cost management would be super straightforward, in my opinion. Right now, we're in a stage where enterprises, as Ricardo is saying, right, they have options and opportunities and they're evaluating them. So cost management, have, but they've also learned from the very early days that if you don't think about the cost at all, sometimes you get a crazy bill and you're like, where did this come from? And so I think we're in that stage of more heightened awareness plus greater options minus commodification leads to people having the FinOps approach, which they really, really, they should. And I think it'll, it'll be some years of us all working together before we're at a point where it's like pretty straightforward. You don't need to really worry about the cost side. Nice, nice. Well, I know that Kubernetes is, uh, one of the advantages has always been the, uh, uh, the ability to optimize the workloads. And so it makes sense to really drill into that and uh, see what, you know, what all you can get from that. Not just to save a few months, but not just to save some money, but also, you know, be more efficient all around. Yes, 100%. Uh, so my hat's off to the uh, forward planning team uh, to put a conference together in 2022, especially in Europe. Uh, so I, I was just kind of curious as to, uh, you know, we, we still have to deal with COVID. Uh, what, what, what was, what was uh, the approach with COVID? What will the approach be with COVID? I know you guys took a lot of precautions in LA. Uh, will it be the same in, in uh, Spain? So uh, we are being very cautious with uh, with health requirements for the event. You know, as of now, the in-person attendees are required to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, and that is something that is definitely not going to change no matter what. We okay. are going to expect the vaccination status. Uh, but at this and at this time, we are requiring masks to be worn at the event at all as well. Um, and we'll have like, you know, the additional safety protocols like temperature checks and sanitizing and all of that listed on our events, health and safety page. But I do encourage people to keep tabs on that page and keep checking because we are monitoring closely what Spain's national requirements and guidelines are. And based on that, things are subject to change, except for the vaccination requirement, which is not going to change. 
And you'll still use the same app that you guys used last year? Yes. Oh, okay. Nice, nice. Uh, now, yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine how you would uh, anticipate what was uh, all the troubles that the Ukraine is seeing now and how that might spill over to the rest of Europe. Uh, what is, has, there any been, has there been any thinking ab about this along terms of what you may have to do? Yes, I mean, even, yeah. first, first of all, it's like I, I say I speak for all of us in Linux Foundation, and I say that we are devastated by the conflict in Ukraine. We're really, really, we really, our hearts go out to the people there. We all have no people who are who live in Ukraine. Who I have a colleague from CNCF in Ukraine. It's very, very stressful. Um, my little small thing, I wore the Ukraine flag <laughs> as a clip today. But um, really what we are, with all that's going on, what we are hoping is as of now, there's still some time till the event, right? We have at least two months. We are hoping for things to de-escalate, for, for the situation to calm down. We are lucky in that that like the location of Valencia within Europe is far towards the West and it does not border either Ukraine or Russia. And so if we do not anticipate on the ground challenges at the event location. Um, I think, you know, ultimately, and this is where, again, the essential, it, this is how, why it's essential to always have the hybrid option is like, we, we have meeting place sorted. We have the virtual elements sorted. So should the situation deteriorate, well, we're already set up for the virtual portion. Um, but we are really, really hopeful uh, that in the next two months, the situation de-escalates, calms down, people get safe, and we can all we can all stop thinking about this great human tragedy that's happening. Uh, on the lighter side, what are some of the fun activities that KubeCon attendees will uh, could participate in this this round? All the usual fun stuff. We'll have the welcome reception, the sponsor booth call, booth crawl on Wednesday night, and this is you know there's just so much fun with food, drinks, etc. There's also the all attendee party. I am not yet allowed to tell you like more details about the all attendee party, but what I will let slip is that it is going to be in a very, you know, traditional Spanish location, which I'm really excited about. And so I think there'll be a very Spanish Valencia flair to everything that's programmed for folks. And it'll be extra fun because of that. All right, fantastic. And uh, just a bit before uh, we let you guys go, uh, can we the the next KubeCon US show? Uh, this is in the week of October twenty fifth, and this is this is coming up in Detroit. And uh, I gotta say, Detroit's got it going on. I really like Detroit. Yes, totally. So, by the way, it's going to be our first time hosting a KubeCon in the Midwest. So it's a total first. We're really excited, and I mean, you know, there's. As you said, like there's a lot going on for Detroit right now. It's like, of course, it's known for the cars and Motown, but there's like a lot to take in and explore. You know, I mean, you, there's like, it's like, by the way, TL, like I recently TIL was that it's the only major American city north of Canada. So that's something. Oh, <laughs> and nice. then, yeah. And it's like so much there. Like unexpectedly, it's become a big food scene. So cool restaurants have popped up. Uh, and apparently there's also like a rich musical and industrial heritage. So for me, as someone who has never really been, I am like really stoked to check out a totally new scene. I think it's going to be KubeCon North America this year is going to be really, really exciting. Um, the town is amazing. The town is also home to a lot of end users. Think about it, right? A lot of car manufacturers, yeah. so many companies. Uh, we will touch a completely different audience. So very, very excited about that. All right. All right. Fantastic. Uh, so any closing thoughts uh, from either Ricardo or Priyanka about, about this year's show in Valencia? Uh, from, from my side, I would just say that uh, I'm, I'm, again, super happy also to have the opportunity to have these conferences in person. Like The virtual option is great, but I think uh, the in-person conferences uh, have, have their own value and, and there's a lot to be, yes. to be gained about uh, meeting people directly and exchanging ideas. And uh, 
going to these uh, events uh, um, on the side of the conference as well. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Uh, I would raise that. <laughs> Yes, from my side, I echo everything Ricardo said. I'm so excited to see people again in person. I also think people should remember we are all going onward and upward. We're going forward in our cloud native journey. We are verticalizing. There'll be lots of news around different verticals and all of that. So you will you will hear more on that. Uh, but I think so be prepared for lots of growth, lots of opportunity, as is the hallmark of all things cloud native. All right. Fantastic. Well, I thank you both for uh, giving us an early glimpse into what we'll see in Valencia in May. And I thank you listeners for tuning in. We hope to see you all at the show. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.